We have our Candace Dodson Award. This is for this the Candace Dodson Award is provided, and I'm gonna move back to here. Um, okay, I will stand right here. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so we are going to do. Should we introduce those people? Yeah, I'm going to. Okay. Um, so why are we on a Google Meet? Let's say that first. This is our lovely IDOE team. They are the ones who allow us to have this conference, this lovely grant. Yes. Part of this grant is we want to have a, a Candace Dodson Award. And if you don't know who Candace is, she was uh, a innovator, a thought leader, and a very empowering person in the state. So um, we would love to give our Candace Dodson Award it's right here. It's right here. To the lovely, the one and only Miss Diana Smith, Mrs. Diana Smith. So we want to give Diana our award. So we chose Diana um, because ever I'm, I'm so excited. She was an English teacher like I was. Then she chose the technology route as well. Um, she empowers women in technology. She is innovative in all of our e-learning stuff that the state has been doing. And we are so lucky and blessed to have her as our thought leader as the IBOE director of, stop, I, you're gonna make me cry, <laughs> director of digital learning. Um, I was so excited to be able to um, be the one to give it to her because she has just been a role model and one of my favorite people um, and has impacted my my teaching career. So, Diana, we will send this to you. Thank you. There is nobody else.
high school principal, county assistant superintendent, key executive director, and he's kind of the guy behind hashtag edu protocol. So. I actually wore that hard hat to make sure that it says boss. <laughs> You're up. So the concept is basically like, uh, and I don't know if many of you have seen this, is uh, uh, plus one. Have you guys heard of plus one? Which is not when you invite a friend to the party without telling people that's a different kind of plus one. But the idea basically, uh, we did this at some of the Google stuff, which is it's a game you play where I go, Matt, we're going to do a field trip. And then Matt's job is to say, we're going to go out of town field trip. And then I'll go overnight. And then he goes, Chicago. And I go, yes. So the idea is to like get used to building on ideas instead of saying I'm busy or it's going to cost too much. So the idea is like how can we positively, creatively keep momentum about new ideas? Oh, I thought it was like Google Plus. Yeah, Google, Google Plus. Plus. Yeah, Google Plus one thing. Yes, yeah. and that's that was your company. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah, like plus one. So I think that's probably where the Google people got from. So each of us has not seen the other guy's slide. So we came up with six questions, and I haven't seen his slides. He hasn't seen mine. So one of us is going to get three minutes to share, and then the other person gets two minutes to plus one, like live on stage here. And we've got some good subjects like homework or paper or ed tech. So we're going to try to give you guys some, some ideas, but not just like a lecture, because now there's this drama layer of what's going to happen next. Um, so it's, a really, it's just a really fun format. And uh, we we don't know what the other person is going to say. We're doing this one. We have practice zero minutes. So for those of you who saw my my keynote yesterday, you can know how totally non-anxiety inducing this is for me to have no idea what the other half was going to be saying, and I have to be ready to go on the spot. So I'm super excited <laughs> to do all of this with you and just fly off the cuff. So and I have no anxiety because I have no idea what's happening. So are you not? And John just gave me a bunch of directions, and I hope I followed them correctly. So, if you're asking today, yeah, you so, have no idea. So, there's, we kind of already did this one, but the wrinkle is the other guy who knows the company. And again, we're trying to look at like non binary solutions. It doesn't have to be field trip or not, it can lead to a whole other thing, right? Um, and it's not about being polarizing. A lot of times in education, we're like, whole language. <laughs> math facts. Math facts? Not math facts. Oh, there you go. Like, so the idea is here to, to not be like either or. Like how can we kind of mesh ideas? And then sometimes when I'm talking to a teacher uh, that's creative, like maybe not in will have, we'll have a whole new idea that nobody brought to the party. So that's the idea. Positive com uh, conversations when we need to generate new ideas and everything. Right now, the teaching is a really rich time for needing new ideas. Kind of get a hint for that. Like we need stuff, so let's start modeling how that works. So again, three minutes to share, and then two minutes to plus one. So we'll we'll take turns on the share. And the first one is Star Wars versus Star Trek. So we're starting low cognitive load, so we can model. We'll get into the teaching stuff in a second. And I think I go first. Okay. So here's mine, Star Trek or Star Wars. Uh, I give it a tie, but they both created a new paradigm in, in sci-fi and in film. Like when Star Trek came out, technologically speaking, it was a whole new look. Everything had been very kind of Buck Rogers even before that, and it moved into this kind of higher thinking, metacognitive thinking. Star Wars, same kind of thing. Like the sci-fi was not really cool before Star Wars, and it really brought it uh, to like the masses. So next slide. Um, you've got, and I don't know if you guys have ever noticed some of the defects. Look how they did the land speeder. Look, they just hung a little mirror down the side. It's a three wheel bike thing. So, and then if you look very carefully on the, on the jib, that's Florida. <laughs> they just put a color overlay on Earth. They were too lazy to design a planet. So, both of them were really good at hacking stuff together and creating new things. One of the other trivia things is. You only see the Enterprise from one side because the arm that held it up on the green screen was on the other side. So you'd only see it from one side. This is the only time where they were able to get a good shot. Okay, next slide. Um, they both kind of go through the hero's journey, which I like. So you've got your protagonist, you've got your near death experience. That's really cool. I'm going to call that one a tie. Next slide. 
But I'm gonna, uh, and then they both uh, remind me of school stuff. So I've got my class of triples, and I've got that one kid who's eating stuff that he's not supposed to be eating. So school-wise, it's very relevant for me. Next slide. Uh, but I'm gonna give the win to Star Trek. Feel free to clap and cheer. For me, it's Star Trek. Because much like Batman, Kirk doesn't have any magical powers. So I think he falls into the range of more like Flash and teacher, right? No magic powers, he's got to do it with just a Mark I human brain. So that's that's my wrap up and now and then gets to come. Plus one in it. Plus one in it. Yep. So Okay, so don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the plus one hat uh, for the choice of Star Trek, one of the things that stands up to me was this utopian world that Star Trek presented itself as being. And one of the things that stands out from the original Star Trek is actually the diversity of the cats, which had never before been seen on television. And I actually just saw a quote today uh, from Whoopi Goldberg who had said that she had turned on TV and Star Trek had turned up. And she, for the first time, saw a black woman as not a man on television. And Lieutenant Afora, who unfortunately just passed away, Michelle Nichols just recently passed away, um, she was a woman who was a powerful position on the enterprise in terms of communication. And that just hadn't existed. So the plus one, that diversity is huge. Next plus one with Star Wars, though, is that this is where I'll get super nerdy as a nerdy teacher. Star Wars isn't sci-fi, it's fantasy. And there's a huge difference between the two. And the reason I did note that is Star Trek is actually based on science. Like, a lot of what drives Star Trek is science. What drives Star Wars is religion, to a certain degree, the force, the whole concept of that. So I'm not saying religion is fantasy, but the supernatural is all about Star Wars, where Star Trek is very much in a world where scientists today talk about warp drive. Scientists today talk about teleportation. So, seconds. how much? 30. 30 seconds? Yeah. So, for me, the plus one on Star Wars now is that they are showing a far more diverse world where George Lucas' original world was very British and very white and very male. Where now, if you actually dive deeper, watch Rebels, uh, watch Clone Wars, watch these other shows that show a diversity, and really the opportunity to stand up for what's right, and that's what I love about Star Wars, is that it really carried on that message, where Star Trek was, everything's pretty cool. Time's up. Okay, so, you guys see the format here? I can't only do this the question was Star Trek versus Star Wars, but yes, I think really good additional things, I like the diversity thing. And I like the way you pointed out uh, that within when Star Trek, you you have the laws of physics still apply, yeah. right? But in, in, in Star Wars, you just make stuff up. So that's cool. Okay, next round. Our next round is Ed Tech versus Paper, and I think Nick starts this one. I think we do. Yep. Slide. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that slide. Uh, so. EdTech versus paper. So it's very interesting. When you look at it, EdTech versus paper can be viewed in a couple of ways. The first way is for a lot of us that integrates technology into what we're doing, the one thing that we're told is don't just replace paperwork with technology work, right? Just because you're using a Google Doc instead of writing on a piece of paper, you're not this master of technology. That's not what we're looking at. But interestingly enough, there's been some research on this. Because there's research on everything. You will remember, and your students will remember information better if you can write it or subtract it on a keyboard. Huge bit of information that is just not talked about in schools, as we have one to one, as we in my school, BYOD, all that information. And so when I get to, can I take notes on my computer? I say, yes, but. Here's important information on how you can retain this information. I think it's great for you to take notes by hand and if you want to take those notes and move them over to a digital space. Right now you're getting that repetition of uh, repetition can help increase that understanding. So I think there is something lost. Now another part of this is should we still be teaching handwriting in classes? The elementary classes and things like that. The other question is should we be teaching keyboarding? And my answer to both of those is no. 
You shouldn't teach keyboarding. Kids should be using computers. Should you be teaching handwriting? Kids should be writing. Again, the research shows us that like with vocabulary, just giving lists of vocab words to memorize and then use out of context is terrible at retention. Learning words through the act of reading stories and how they work and function is what helps in understanding and retention. So much like ed tech versus paper, it should never be an either or. I, as a tech guy, I have my notebook, I have my pencil, I write down all my notes, I have everything there. And then if it's really, really important, I will transfer it over digitally so that I can have it in a space that I need in case I don't have my notebook with me. So in the grand scheme of things, I'm going to say that you still need to love and use our paper because it's going to be a foundational tool, plus at a bare minimum, it is equitable across the board. Learning how to write a paper is something that everyone will need to do at a base. And then going from there, those opportunities to take those skills and turn them into technological skills will be there. Nice. 15 seconds to spare. Ooh, so efficient. Right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Your time's valuable, I get it. <laughs> the other thing that we're showing here, though, is look how much we can get in in that three minutes because of constructs, right? You could have, we could have done a whole slideshow just on that, but he gave us plenty of information and now I'm going to add on. I got like 10 slides. Okay, so the law of the instrument is an over reliance, and, and I'm strongly with the very teacher on this one. Paper is not our enemy, but it cannot be the only tool. Next. So if I'm going to put in sprinklers, which tool do I select? Yeah, because my, the dirt in my house is super soft, right? And there's no roots. Like, I can do that with a spoon or I can do it with a transfer. One way I'll have more green beans. Next one. Um, paper's fine. I'm not cool with stacks of paper that are sitting on my desk and grading. So this is one of the downsides of paper, especially for high school teachers. I might be, I might be gathering three or 400 pieces of paper a day from students in some cases. So that's a problem. But is paper a problem? Not necessarily. Next slide. Um, this one I showed you guys this morning. I had kids do 6,000 questions in about 10 minutes a day. Cannot do this, even with Scantron based paper. It would take a long time. These kids are getting their scores immediately and seeing the results. Next slide. Um, also, I would argue that while we can be very creative on paper, for sure, check with Leonardo da Vinci, for example. Um, the equity piece of the four C's allows kids to not have to be able to draw well, to be able to participate well. I think that tech lends itself to more creativity. Next slide, 30 seconds. This is the kind of stuff kids can make when they're not stuck with paper. This is fourth graders making this in 10 or 15 minutes. So again, it's, it's not a good, bad thing. It's just what are my options? Last slide, I think that was it. Yeah, so paper is not the enemy, but it cannot be the only tool. So I think that was the last one. Oh, yeah, so is, um, yeah, we don't want to use tech that way. Clickers, we do want to have devices, we want to have World Wide Web, and we want to have uh, slides, slides, creating. Time's up. Sorry, I couldn't help it. Couldn't help. <laughs> and to pull my, my second grade friend this way. Our next topic is homework. I think John picked this one up. Okay, homework. Yes, here we go. So, I used to be this guy. I had my kids line up by number. I was a Harry Warren acolyte. If you didn't have your homework, you called your mom to turn yourself in. I was a machine. But, next slide, I've been homework free since 2003. I'm going to buy myself a pen on AA. <laughs> <laughs> what was the outcome? What was the outcome of going homework free? Scores didn't go up or down yet. I was just way happy. Next slide. Yeah, I'm way happy. So what I had to do though, next slide, was I had to adjust the way my class worked. How does this, how much turmoil does the science project cost now? 75% of kids cut it, 90% of his parents cut it. Everyone needs the science. So I thought that was just kind of a fun look at it though. When, when we ask kids to do homework, next slide, when we ask kids to do homework, in some cases we're forcing them to make a, a, a 
ethical decision about being truthful about why they did their homework. You can't just lop off the work. You're going to have to replace the work that was homework in class. And we're going to work bell to bell. So when my kids in sixth grade years ago said, when's fun Friday? I go, fun Friday's this summer. Uh, you guys got to don't have homework, which means we got to work all day, right? So I had to rethink what my class looked like. We had to move to more activity and less uh, talking. So I had to reward lecture time and move things around. I, I think that's more social life. And don't do this ever. If you, have, if you don't finish in class, you'll have homework. Guess what? If you tell me that as a 10 year old, I'm not going to work at school or at home. That's the other pernicious piece of homework. I have to deal with the kids in real time in class. Next slide. And then is this other piece. How many of us have signed their six year old's reading log that they didn't really do? <laughs> the side effects of that are kids learning that you can tell the institution teacher false things. For me, I just wanted the crime to stop. But it's tricky. I'd rather research shows us that you're better off to do no homework until seventh or eighth grade instead of developing bad habits. So that's I think that's my last slide. Oh, and then AP does need homework. So yeah, if, you, if you're AP, you're signing up for homework. So just know that. My bigger focus is on AP. Uh, why build eight years of bad habits? You guys, I can teach them how to do homework in three days if that's what they need to do. But I don't need them to play that game for nine years. Rework the way your class works so that when they get to your AP class and they say that their grandma has passed away, it actually happened. Uh, I saw somebody that tweeted, they said, when I moved my class from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., many less grandparents died that semester. <laughs> <laughs> Changing my schedule changed lives. And then this guy did, this guy right here, I shared this one earlier, 72% passing on AP, virtually zero take home grade. Make your class more efficient. And I'm good. I love how I can be like a mixed vegetarian as you're talking and you're like, what am I going to say? And that's the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, join the no homework movement. So, no homework, I think, is fun and awesome and it lives in a really wonderful world. Are you Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> there are no standards that are forced upon you by schools or districts in states. But it's not necessarily a homework issue, really. It's actually a definition issue. Because when we talk about homework, we're teaching about homework, we're actually talking about busy work. Busy work is a problem. Sending home busy work is absolutely a problem. Creating projects that kids are excited to do, it's not if you don't finish it in class, you have to finish it at home. A lot of my kids is, I didn't finish, can I finish it at home? It's because the project isn't busy work. Like, how many times have you seen stacks of word searches at the copy machine that someone hasn't picked up yet? And you're like, oh, sweet. Like, either there's a sub tomorrow or this kid's going home with a word search or a crossword puzzle or things like busy work. Because there's this need of, I'm supposed to give X amount of hours of work a day for this grade level. So it's not homework that's the problem. Because as an English teacher, I'm sorry, you're reading at home. The flipped classroom is homework. We wouldn't call it that, we call it a flipped class. Branding is everything. It is. Branding is everything. So as an English teacher, that means we would read every day in class. The next day we would discuss, and nothing would ever be read at home. That's not conducive to how an ELA class needs to run based on what's required of us as an ELA teacher. Like, I've tried that. Now, by switching to projects and having more kids go, ooh, I get to read at home because I'm working on this project. So I think, as we plus one this, it's about changing the wording that we're using, that branding. We're not going to have homework, but hey, if you want to keep working on this at home because you really like owning this project, go for it. It's all you. And the kids are excited, and by changing that, I've changed the dynamics in my class where kids don't feel forced with homework. They feel like they get to continue working on something they're excited about. And do you see how we're able to find common ground? Because I agree with everything you said. Can I get a round of applause? So we used to have, when, when parents would come to our charter school, we would grab kids to give them tours. And our logic was, if the kids can tell the story, their parents will want to come here. So I was, I was following the behind one of our guys who's like a 1.9. He's the guy that's a tour guy. I'm like, oh, I wonder how this is going to go. 
And they're walking on, and the parents go, do you guys get a lot of homework? And he goes, we don't get any homework. And I can see the parents processing, going, like, what's this high school going to be like with no homework? And then he pauses, and he goes, God, I have to share a lot of projects, though. And that's, I think, where you're at. It's redefining the nature of the work and the student opportunity to engage the work. That's the key. If you're just sending them packets to waste time to make mom and dad happy, probably not the right idea. Well, and it's changing the conversation with the parents. I have had parents go and say, my kid isn't getting enough work. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, enough? Well, when I was in school, and I'm getting to the point where a lot of these parents are like probably my age, I'm 43, and I'm like, yeah, that was miserable. Weren't you miserable? Like, <laughs> no part, like, are you positively reminiscing about these times of like hours and hours of work? Your kid gets enough work to do to help further their understanding. Now, at least with me in my class, I tell kids, listen, you might have some math and science and this and that to do, and if you say, hey, I need to do this, and this is the decision I had to make not get to yours, I'm like, cool, because part of actually doing the work is also I don't have a late policy. Because sometimes some kids need to take longer to complete things than it does for other kids. The minute I got rid of my late policy, and essentially just communicate and we'll move forward, all of a sudden, I had a ton more work and even completed instead of a kid going, well, it's already late, so whatever. So again, eliminating and removing restrictions regarding assessment and homework and stuff like that really brings in more engagement from the students. So make a note next week. Uh, next year, we need to do one about late policy. That's a whole other party right there. Our next topic is, should we gamify learning? <laughs> well, that's why I'm a late night gamer. Right. Um, should we gamify learning? So, there's definitely the side of like, not everything is a game, not every single class is a game. Sometimes you just need to learn the content. Totally get it. And the other side of it, there's that everything should be a game, everything should be fun, and let's use what kids are excited about to help them learn, right? So, where I fall, not surprisingly, is somewhere in the middle. Now, when we talk about learning, I, I hope that we're talking about learning and not behavior. Because there has been a movement of gamifying behavior. Getting points for positive behavior or not getting points for negative behavior. Like, it used to be a chart in the class where every single kid would see how every single kid is doing. And you were the terrible kid, and so you know your little sticker never moved along the thing, or like it was just like a slash public shaming type of situation that was going on. Uh, we're seeing digital versions of that. Um, my son, in particular, this is a great example where you would get a number one, two, three, or four written on your plan at the end of the day. The teacher came around and wrote a number. And so he came home and I'm looking at the planner, and clearly the number had been erased and another number had been written there. I'm like, seriously, my wife had sort of like missed it because she was like, this number doesn't matter. So we had told him, this number doesn't matter to us. Like, we don't care about whatever this number is. Some days you're going to be a one, some days you're a four, we don't care. And so she just sort of glanced at it and said, okay. And I just said, you know, did you erase? the number and put a four here. And he had this look on his face, you know, that look where you're hot, you're like, oh man. And I said, I don't care that, you know, you don't have a four there. And he just broke down in tears. So he goes, I just wanted a four for once. That's all like, just that moment as a parent slash teacher, my heart just broke into a million pieces because he, even though he had two parents saying, this does not matter, we do not care. That was the class culture. It does matter. Yes, the class culture was this matters. And he saw friends, of course. He saw kids smile. And behavior is not a game. You know, and I talked about my keynote about neurodiversity and stuff like that. That kid who dealt with anxiety had to sit there and wait for a teacher every day for a full year, come to his desk, and whether or not he's a kid, that's a long way. Right? And to figure out whether or not he was valued at a one, two, three, or four that day. Right? And then those points and all of that means something, right? So when we talk about gamification, there are some things like, hey, you're going to get a badge for accomplishing this. And like, you're in my major space and you learned to build something with Raspberry Pi. I'm going to give you a Raspberry Pi badge so you can show it off on your computer. That's like, look at me. I earned this thing. 
that's awesome, right? Because that doesn't make other people feel bad. It doesn't call other people out who haven't learned it yet. But when we talk about gamifying behavior, that is a system that rewards kids who meet neurotypical expectations and consistently punishes kids who do not. So I'm a yes and no on this one, where we can have fun with gamification, and I'm a Minecraft education guy, and that's gamified learning and coding and science and two thumbs up. But anything to do with what's considered normal appropriate behavior and gamifying that, and dead set against, and there are certain teachers at my son's school that don't like receiving my emails because of that. <laughs> So, okay, in what year did the four thing happen? Uh, that was two years ago. In 1971, what I remember is that I was the only kid that didn't have one gold star. I'm a red star. Other people have gold, red, and blue. I, what I learned from the game was that I'm always red. And I'm still sad about that to this day, and I can't even remember what a red got me. So, I totally agree. I will hear, and again, if you're a primary teacher, remember, one of the things that Nick and I like to do is cause you to reflect on what we're doing to other people. The empathy piece matters. What's the recipient getting? I will hear primary teachers say these words. Uh, this technology is not developmentally appropriate. Have you guys ever heard that phrasing? Tell me how public humiliation is developmentally appropriate. <coughs> Tell me how a flip chart is developmentally appropriate. So just kind of put that on a continuum. Um, now I'm going to switch back to the other side of the game, which is more the pedagogical side. Um, you don't have to create a big scoreboard. You don't have to play Jeopardy every day. You don't have to have special like crypto bucks or things. You don't have to create a whole economy. Just with the people, how much fun did we have losing big on Turkish foods in my group? Lose big. But then, with a little feedback, how did we do it? We went from like 38 percent to 89. That's a very small form of gamification. And in my world, the worse you do on the first one, just means you're going to grow more on the second. So thinking about iteration, repetition, allowance for failure, but with some data to guide you along. Because the worst thing about school is when I just do worksheets and they come back with smiling face or star. I still want feedback. I just don't want fake feedback. And I don't want feedback based on your ideas. I want feedback based on the actual world. So just to do a little wrap up because I'm going to slide over time. Gamify just means that there's a score, there's rules, and that there's um, a timer of some type. A timer can be points. But when you emphasize work in that environment, you're moving from doing activities to training for a skill. I'm going to leave you guys with that. One thing uses up time, and the other one we're getting better, which is what every sports team does. Our next topic is should coding count as a foreign language? Okay. Job up. So. What was your that was my slide or not? Next slide. Next slide. Guess what? What do we have? Grammar, syntax, logic, story, right? All those things are present in coding. Next slide. Uh, have you guys ever heard of the one semester Spanish love song? Look it up on YouTube. It is hilarious. The chorus is, que hora es, que hora es. And it's just a series of nonsensical Spanish phrases that we learn over an entire semester. One of the, one of the stanzas is, uh, <laughs> so it's a really hilarious, but I'm using this for a point that um, this is also a language. And if you guys haven't seen code, seen code Combat, my STEM teachers and coding teachers, look what kids are doing over there. It's free for about five or six levels. There's a storyline, and they're learning semantics, they're learning syntax. You have to have perfect grammar, or how does your game work? Perfect grammar is required. And as a side, I was talking to uh, some teachers yesterday, one who teaches Spanish, and one says that to emphasize the way that this, the subject verb goes in Spanish, 
she runs around the class yelling, I hit love, I hit love, <laughs> because it's showing the kids that differentiation. So next slide. I actually said this at a big event in Washington, D.C. I said, well, maybe we shouldn't teach math. Because they asked me, what's the future of math instruction? I said, maybe we should stop. Because in California, only 36% of kids pass the end of the year test in math. And not everybody wants to do your algorithms. Sorry. I took Algebra 2 with the highest level of math I took, and I'm still not using that. And now we're making kids take pre-trade to get in college. I think there's one more slide. What if we teach coding, spreadsheets, database, and infographics to everybody, and we'll get the math as a byproduct? You see the switch there? So I've kind of gone off topic a little bit, but I always think about this when we talk about coding. Can every kid get an A in coding, you guys? Every kid can get an A in coding. They can. Every kid get a, can get an A in spreadsheets. Every kid can get an A in database. They can. It's a very finite world. And think about this. If you're walking through the mall and every person is good at spreadsheets, how is your economy and your nation probably? Meanwhile, we have people that are afraid of spreadsheets. Right? If you understand how to make infographics, you can read data better. That's super important for a national economy. Five seconds to spare. Ooh. In my workshop yesterday, we were having a conversation, and I sort of mentioned something like this, where you know people always just assume that teaching coding is trying to convert all of these students into coders. And I remember I said yesterday, it's grooming, right? It's, Use that word now. <laughs> um, that we teach biology, but we're not expecting a nation of biologists, right? Because the idea behind biology is that, oh, I understand how things work. I took a geology class. I'm like, oh, I understand plate tectonics. I'm like, a volcano explodes. Oh, I get it. Now, I'm not a volcanologist. I can't explain the depths of all that, but I go, oh, I get it. And I can transfer some of those skills of understanding or make hypotheses or understand global pandemics a little bit better because I understand my anatomy and physiology class. Like, I had a base of it, right? Language is a really weird thing, though. Every single language teacher will tell you this is almost pointless unless you use it every single day. Every single teacher. Everyone's like, well, I took classes, but I didn't really learn it until I spent six months in Spain. And I used it like, what? That's not helping any of these kids actually. So you're basically saying the premise of foreign language education is totally broken. So for foreign language, you watch the movie Selena, which I love, they cry at, but that's not teaching Spanish. Yeah, it's not teaching Spanish. So with coding, it's the same concept. If you want kids to have an experience with a language like Spanish, or I took German for two years and a year of Spanish, having an introduction to coding or cybersecurity and like understanding those concepts, I think are fundamentally important. We don't want to turn everyone into a coder, but we look at this world now, we need people to better understand how technology functions and doing basic coding can help you with that. So I would love to see it as an option. And frankly, on the other side of it, I would love to see ASL equal foreign language as well. How is that not also something that you can take? So just expanding that definition of what language is, I think is beneficial to all people who maybe don't excel at understanding foreign languages, but can sit behind a computer and code like a wizard. Yeah, and I want to add on the agree that the point of a coding class is not to make every kid a coder. You'll hear people say, well, this is pointless because AI will be doing all the coding for us. If AI is doing all the coding for us, for sure we have an idea how that works. <laughs> and if that's happening, does that want to be a physical magic box to yeah. everybody but the four guys? <laughs> that's a bad idea. I've seen Terminator, I know how it is. <laughs> and also, you may have a kid in there who is a, a, an incredibly uh, facile brain for being a coder, and if we don't make them take a coding class, they will never know about that linking skill. So there's part of it's just exposure. Well, it's equity too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are yeah. some kids culturally who are told that this is not for you. And girls, we see in STEM in particular, are told, oh, you're, well, you should take the arts classes. This is what you should be doing. 
like everyone, everyone engage in it, you will have those kids go, oh, I'm good at this? Okay, I didn't expect that. And then go into dive into these areas in ways that they never would before. Now we're in plus one over those yeah. videos. Um, Gim Kit, you guys know the game Gim Kit? Yeah. The kid that owns it's like 23. I got to interview him once and he said, and I quote, I hated math in school, but now I'm a coder for a living. That's a shift. Also, Blook It, owned by two 23-year-old kids who also did not like school. So kind of interesting to see that maybe school could have enhanced their skills even more. They've done this just on their own. All right, our next topic is the classroom future. Yeah, that's a big point. Yeah, I think it's both of you on this it's one. It's both of us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a double duet. There we go. I love this one. You love this one. Yes. Yeah. Crank the wheel will to come out and go through the wires. <laughs> what we've got is we've made this wireless. It's the same program. Yeah. Uh, Write the books into PDFs, give the kids headphones. <laughs> so 1910. 1910 is the origin of this photo, and I love this photo. The French World Exposition. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and this is what the year 2000 will look like, according to them. So they were looking 90 years into the future, and not far off, right? Again, I think there is some issue to this where it's taking traditional and then still just spitting it into the kids' brains to take. And there are some that absolutely still teach this way. Well, I'm reading from my iPad now, if you guys have your iPads or Chromebooks or whatever, and they, they teach no differently than if it were 1910. The delivery system has changed, but it's not, right? It's one of those things where just doing something digitally that you did exactly in paper isn't a high-tech function, right? We're not jumping up that scale. But as we look at the classroom of the future, what is it? Um, it's not robot teachers. Um, although it seems to be in states across the country are lowering what it means to be certified as a teacher nowadays. Um, so someone's going to have to program those robots, okay? So we have robot teachers. We have that coding class in 2020, so one kid knows how to. Exactly. Um, tech and classrooms of the future are still going to be based completely on the passion of the teacher and the classroom. What you bring to the students every single day is going to be paramount. And here's the thing, and this is something I suggested, we as teachers and teacher colleges, we need more required psychology, sociology training. We need it. We are the forefront of dealing with all the social emotional learning. Very few of us are qualified to even talk about that with kids. All the support, all the support of our LGBTQ plus community students. There are teachers out there that are like, I want to be an ally, but what the heck does that mean? They don't know, and that's not their fault because there aren't resources available all over the place and there are community pressures. Like the classroom of the future is still going to hinge very much on the individual that's standing there, and we need to absolutely change the college preparation program because learning to write a very terrible multiple choice test is no longer an important skill set in the college prep program. Learning how to deal with a student with an eating disorder, a student that's having uh, pronoun choices to make and they're not sure where to go or what to do, those are the skill sets that student teachers need. And I understand that there are teachers who feel woefully unprepared for that, but that doesn't mean that we should do something about it. So we need to put all of our emphasis on getting all of those young teachers and preparing them for a classroom that frankly doesn't exist even today. Like, you know the joke, it's like, kids are going to be in jobs, that, that's always been it. That's literally every day. Forever. Yeah, forever. Kids are in school and they're going to be in jobs that don't exist. The biggest one, no one's book, is that teachers are going to be in classrooms that don't exist. Can you imagine none of us? All right, I graduated college in 2000, whatever it was, 2001, 2002. The classroom looks nothing like 2000. Every single kid's going to have a mobile tablet. I saw that on the Jetsons. It was awesome. I saw it on Star Trek. It was awesome. But now literally every single kid. You can hold thousands of songs on this thing. It's insane. I wasn't prepared for it. What? Like, straight up, like my degree, worthless when it comes to actual instruction. Learning on the fly is a very difficult thing, so we need to look at how we do teacher instruction for the classroom of the future. But our clothes are never changing. 
Oh, yeah, that's that's true. True. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'll go back. The kid, the kid turned the crank. Look how happy he is. <laughs> he's whistling because he's not having to do the headphone thing. He's stoked. Okay, next slide. I took a totally different approach, Nick, but I think we're totally we're living in a Venn diagram here. A future class. No more one to one. I think kids are going to bring their own device that they own in the future. I think kids using a school computer at some point is going to look weird. Think about it. Like they may have a cochlear implant phone or they're working on a contact lens computer right now. Did you guys know that? A contact lens, and I'm not saying I like it. I'm just saying some at some point there may be a time where districts buying computers for kids could be not a thing. Uh, next one. Kids first culture. I think this is a revolution that we can get going. Uh, and Nick's done a great job of advocating this. What if school starts moving to the strengths that the kid needs to develop or unmask or discover? I think moving from uh, I'm going to tell you stuff, which goes back to the head of the world, to uh, kids learning and enjoying that learning process. Because I got bad news for you guys. That's what they're getting to do in their Montessori schools and their Waldorf schools. All the schools that are draining kids out of public education are kid-centric. And I know because I've done it, I started a school, we grew from 30 kids to 500 kids at a high school because we were talking about what kids need instead of what teachers are going to do to them. And I think that's going to become more of a thing. You guys need to be aware of that. Next one. Uh, I think we're going to be looking at four C's, more about creativity, more about communication, collaboration. The optimal school environment is when kids are producing things that are open-ended and sharing them with the larger world. Next one. Um, I think we're going to start developing a teacher hive mind. When I was in school in the early 70s, Nick, not to make you feel young, um, I would take out of school and we had six nuns and they never talked to anybody about school except for the mythical two days where they went to sit the nun thing in Kansas City. But they didn't go to conferences, they didn't have social media, they didn't have, they just did their thing. They were trained by college, and then they ran that plan for their whole career. I think we're moving to a place where like Nick and Adam and Seth and Matt and I are in and Allison, where it's all of us are working on these old things. Uh, Steve Gambo calls it um, constant light touches. Yeah. Yeah. So we're learning things from each other. I see a picture, I'm like, oh my god, I had an idea. Instead of I gotta wait until the district gives me training. I think that is gonna continue to morph and grow. Because it's happening right now. If you look at what's going on on TikTok, if you're not on TikTok, you're wrong. There's over 17 billion views under the hashtag teacher. Billion. You don't have to do the LeBron James stuff or the cat videos. Just look at the education stuff. Okay, next one. That's not good on TikTok. Yeah. Oh, oh now I'm definitely signing up. <laughs> <laughs> Rethink teacher contracts. I totally forgot what I meant when I said that. <laughs> so just your face, individual list? Yeah. Well, just, oh, I know. Wow, I now I remember. Okay, so here's my fantasy. The, um, every teacher gets a, a, a for sure sabbatical between eight, year eight and year 11. Every teacher has to take a sabbatical between year eight and 11. They basically become a TOSA for one year. They're a teacher with no class. That's what a TOSA is. Uh, and it's not a sabbatical. They can work in their district to push in and work with other teachers at dissimilar grade levels, or they can work in an adjoining. They get the same pay, but every 10 years, they have to do one of them. So in your career, theoretically, you can do that three times. I've learned so much by working in five districts, it's insane. That's my secret weapon. I'm not smarter than anybody. I've had a chance to work in five districts in two county offices. My cornucopia is bigger. Did you have a thought? Uh, I would love to see that for admin. I would love to see yeah. the opposite every eight years. How about this? Admins have to sub at least one day a month. Every <laughs> month. Yes. Can I get eight in? <laughs> Chase the soup, admins. Chase the soup. I can say that in my school, um, our, so it's a, it's a pre K 12 within, within school, um, our head of the school, so I think it's like, it's like a superintendent of all three divisions, uh, he teaches English classes and has uh, a cohort in the high school, like their uh, homeroom. That he has. Like, that is fundamentally important to him. All they have, they teach a class. It's fundamental. And the reasoning is simple. 
how am I going to, one, evaluate teachers if I have no idea what's really going on in the classroom? Two, how can I serve a parental community if I can't say this is what the experience of a teacher is like in the classroom? And I can say those relationships are fundamentally, I'm going to say different than the ones I've had where an administrator hasn't been in the classroom in 20 years after they only spent three, three to five. Yeah, three to five. They've never lived in no child left behind. They've never yeah. gotten one to one. They don't know what it's like to have a, a class that's 40% grandparents raising the class kind of came in for that. They don't know. Yeah. They don't know. That's like I own a restaurant, but I've never been in the kitchen. How are you going to run that restaurant? So I'm, I'm with you on the, the rethinking of that and, and building in that time. Uh, and I think that I should have said rethinking educator contracts, right? And then here's my, I think this is the last one, right? Is, that, is there one after? Oh, and that's a fun one. Okay. So I want to rethink state assessments. Why? What's the meaning of a three weeks of craziness in May? What if we had a quick 30 minute assessment that felt like gym kids at the end of September? 30 minutes, a little math, a little language arts, a little writing, 30 minutes. Now I have feedback. I can actually teach them for what they need for the November quiz. And then we do the February quiz. Each one's 30 to 40 minutes. And by the end of the year, I make sure everybody's passing. But how do I make money off of that? Oh, we're going to get more assessments. <laughs> um, so just think about that, looking at assessments differently. Because what we're doing right now is a really a dead man walking model. It's, it's, a, it's not OK. In California, our state assessments have been black for seven years. And we spent like 200 million a year giving that out with no results. Okay, last one. I think comfy classrooms are going to become more normal. I'm still seeing a lot of classrooms with furniture that is what I would consider not comfy. But I think that if, think what that kind of a future looks like. Like kids have their own devices. We're kid centric. We're focused on kids. Um, we're bringing them four C's full time. Teachers are connected with teachers outside of their state, outside of their county, outside of their nation. We got contracts where admins are pushing in, which lowers class sizes. What? We've got rolling state assessments, so we're not freaking out. We're having a chance to adjust the year on the fly, not being held accountable for one day a year. And then the classrooms are actually uh, biometrically uh, comfortable for people, anthropomorphically acceptable classrooms. So that's my take. I'm going back to the classroom after the past year. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell my boss. Let me see if I can order the same for you. We already plus one. We already plus one. All the plus one. There you have it. <laughs> and again, just to wrap up, think about bringing this kind of a flow to your staff meetings instead of challenging each other with why we can't. And if there was anything that we said, like, hey, we want to see this and not that, and you're doing that, we don't want anyone to feel bad about that. We just ask for everyone to reflect. Because I've been in a lot of your seats where I've sat in a session, I'm like, oh my goodness, I do all of those things that I'm apparently not supposed to do. I, I've done all the bad things. Yes, all I've done them. all. Everything I'm talking about is bad. I've done it on an industrial scale. Uh, I did a word of the day vocab thing because that's how I was taught in high school. And so I was like, that's what we do. And then I remember I read the first research. It's like, this is a terrible idea. And I was like mortified because I've been doing it for like six years. And I'm like, well, I an apology to a whole bunch of kids. I, 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 threw, I threw a hockey puck at a kid and hit him in the head one time. <laughs> well, I'm not going to. Luckily, it was a nerd hockey puck. <laughs> but it was a very interesting character, you know, I'll tell you that. I would also add that if you heard anything today, you are in a room full of a teacher high mind. Yes. Teacher high mind. I mean, we're all here to brainstorm and work together and support whatever crazy idea you heard them say. We can figure out how to make it happen. Yeah, and then we, you just make me think of this like Seth uh, had seen us do worst presentation ever, which you could just Google worst presentation ever done for the lesson here on YouTube. But Seth took that and he made it into, in his coding class, worst web page ever. Make a really bad web page. Have an MP3 that plays an annoying uh, music box song. Let's go! So that, that's the high line. You see a thing and I add a thing on. You make a weird thing, I make it weirder. And then I see your thing and I'm like, wait, worst video ever. Let's go. But that's part of that idea of that sharing, 
it's being kid-centric. If you want kids to stop breaking the rules, the best thing you can do is make them a presentation about how to break the rules big. And they will call each other out for the rest of the year. They'll be like, bro, that's a lot of bullets on these slides. <laughs> that's a color scheme, no bueno. They will call each other out for Comic Sans again and again. <laughs> Well, we just want to thank John and Nick for being here today and yesterday. We want to thank all of you for being here. We have one more session this afternoon, correct? One more. Well, lots of cookies and, and Chick fil A. Yeah, eat. lots of cookies and Chick fil A. Lots home. of free stuff at the Wildcat Den. Keep an eye on your email. You have some big prizes that we're giving away in the Woo -hoo. next. Take home Chick fil A hour. for dinner. What you Take home Chick fil A for dinner. Take home Chick fil A for dinner. Make sure you're tweeting. And Instagramming and all that fun stuff at Tech Did I forget anything else? Uh, Great. Follow, follow, follow on TikTok. Follow us up on our TikTok. Follow us up on our TikTok. He does bad, bad jokes. He does bad bad jokes. He does regular jokes. You know, you know, you know, there's some people that give bad, bad jokes that aren't bad. It's something called that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Have a great last session.